Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I thank you for listening today, and I thank you also for loving Texas history as much as I do. I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday time with family and friends. I'm recording this episode the first week of January 2017, so Happy New Year as well. We had a warm Christmas down here in Texas, as we often do, and a lot of Texans wish it would snow on Christmas Day. I hear it every year, but I'm sure those of you stuck in the snow up north might wish for a little relief. So I don't know where the sweet spot is, but uh, we had a great Christmas down here. And uh, as I sit in the world headquarters of Wise About Texas, we're in the middle of a clear but cold day. And uh, those are some of the best winter days down here in Texas. So I hope the weather's good where you are. I'm very excited for 2017 and some new things for this podcast. I'm still working on that website revamp that I talked about, and uh, I wish I had a web developer on staff, but I'm, I do it all. It's a one-man band here at Wise About Texas, so uh, you're going to have to be patient on that website. Hopefully, the website as it is now is working well for you, and uh, I can promise you it's going to look a lot better when I get done with it, and we're working on that. It's going to be a busy first quarter for Wise About Texas. We're going to the legislative session is starting in my day job as a judge. I'm involved a lot in legislative issues, so we'll be spending a lot of time in Austin for the next few months, which is always a fun fun thing to do. We're coming into the 181st anniversary period of the Texas Revolution, so you can bet that some of the episodes in the next few weeks are going to be about the revolution. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be the keynote speaker at the Texas Independence Day celebration held annually at Washington on the Brazos, the birthplace of Texas. That's where the convention met to de- sign the Declaration of Independence and the first Constitution. So on March 5th, 2017, come on out to Washington on the Brazos and maybe get inspired to continue your own studies of Texas history. That's going to be a great celebration. Uh, before we get into the revolution, though, I wanted to go a little bit further back in Texas history and tell you a story of a colony that probably I'd say most people haven't really heard of. Uh, It was a French colony, and it didn't even last a year, but it had a pretty profound effect on Texas. So we're going to go back today all the way back to 1818 and maybe a little bit before and get wise about Texas. Well, let me set the stage for you here. Uh, Back in 1818, France had been at war for about 20 years, and these were the days of Napoleon. And, of course, we know that Napoleon was finally defeated at Waterloo in 1815. He was exiled to an island called St. Helena, and the Bourbon monarchy was restored by uh, King Louis XVIII. So we were up to 18 back then. And a bunch of military officers in Napoleon's army decided that that would be a good time to leave France. And they came, a remarkable number of them came to Philadelphia. Napoleon had placed his brother Joseph on the throne in Spain. And Joseph Bonaparte, along with a lot of those officers, actually came to Philadelphia during that time. Now, the United States ended up granting some land to these French exiles, and they granted that land in Alabama. And the deal was that the French colonists would grow wine and grow wine grapes and grow olives. And the president of that society was a guy named Charles Lallemand. Now, I took French in high school, but my goal with this podcast is not to, pro- not to pronounce every French word perfectly. So bear with me. We're going to call him Charles Lallemand. Lallemand was born in 1774, and he was a cavalryman during the French Revolution. He rose to the rank of general, was later given the title of baron, and he and his brother Henry, or Henri, led an unsuccessful revolt against Louis XVIII. Well, they survived that, and uh, Napoleon arrived a little bit later and rewarded Lallemand and made him a general. And Lallemand was... Uh, extremely close to Napoleon throughout his reign and was even present when Napoleon surrendered. Now, Lallemand became famous because of that close association to Napoleon. Uh, In Europe, that was not such a good deal. So he took that opportunity to move to Philadelphia and because of his rank became the president, as I mentioned, of that French Immigrant Association. The association, by the way, was called 
the Society for the Cultivation of the Vine and Olive. Now, that does sound like something we'd all like to be a part of, but uh, that was the association to which the land was granted in Alabama. Um, Now, despite being president of the association, uh, the Society for the Cultivation of the Vine and Olive, Lalamon was not interested in cultivating vines and olives. Restoring the Napoleonic Empire, however, that interested him very much. So what they did, and when I say they, I'm talking about the the uh, recipients of the land grant, the members of this society. They sold those land grants before they even left to look at them. Before they even left Philadelphia, they sold those land grants. And they uh, now the rumors were uh, that Lalamon was interested in Texas. He was interested, perhaps, in putting Napoleon brother Napoleon's brother Joseph on a throne in Central or South America, uh, or he might have been interested in taking Florida from the Spanish, or what have you. His interest in Texas would have been to work with insurgent governments in Mexico to try to capture some territory. But the theme of all of those rumors related to the restoration of Napoleon to the throne. They even discussed going, uh, the rumors were around that, uh, Lalamon and others were trying to hatch a plot to rescue Napoleon from St. Helena. In any event, nobody thought that Charles Lalamon was going to go into agriculture. Um, now, that would have inserted, Lalamon was inserting himself into an already complicated situation because remember the landscape. We had Florida in possession of Spain, we had the United States. As we discussed in a couple of prior episodes, the Louisiana Purchase had occurred. There were some disputes between the U.S. and Spain on the border of where the border was between Louisiana and New Spain. And uh, then we had all the turmoil in Europe. So Lalamon was not making it any easier on anyone. At this time, the border between Louisiana and what was then New Spain and would later be Texas, was subject to an agreement that the military commanders had struck called the Neutral Ground Agreement because there was a serious dispute about where the actual border between what is now the state of Louisiana and now the state of Texas existed. And so there was some ground between uh, the western boundary of which was the Sabine River and the eastern boundary of which was an arroyo uh, in Louisiana, and that area was called the neutral ground, and the military commanders agreed that that would be considered neutral ground and nobody would settle there. Of course, when they left the area, you know, people settled from both from Spain and from the United States, so it didn't really remain unpopulated, uh, but it was still subject to that agreement. So that was the state of affairs when Lallemand sells the land grants, and here's what he did. He announced that there would be a colony in Texas that he would head up for agricultural purposes. Well, that made perfect sense, being the president of the Society for the Cultivation of the Vine and the Olive, and uh, probably sounded pretty good to the powers that be in Washington, D.C. And so Lalamon announces that colony. And uh, think about now, if Lalamon really wanted to restore Napoleon to a throne, uh, why he would pick Texas? Well, Mexico was in revolutionary turmoil, and the eventual outcome, of course, was the liberation of Mexico from Spain, which occurred in 1821. This is a mere three years before. The Mexican government was preoccupied with the revolutionary sentiment in Mexico, and the result of that was that Texas, being the outermost province of Mexico, was really not strongly occupied or strongly governed, though they certainly should have been doing so. So that was opportunity. It was sparsely populated, and Lalamon could go there, and he felt, Lalamon felt, that he would be unmolested and that the Spanish might even, in fact, not even care, care that he was there, but as we'll see, that's not the case. On December 17th, 1817, Lalamon and his expedition set sail aboard the American ship called the Huntress. Now, I just misspoke. I said Lalamon and his expedition. It was his expedition that set sail aboard the Huntress. Huntress. Lalamon was not on board. Uh, The commander of the group on board the Huntress 
was General Antoine Rigaud, and that's R-I-G-A-U-D. Rigaud was also a general in Napoleon's army. He was also a baron. He had fought with Napoleon in the Germanies. He had fought in Spain. And after Napoleon's defeat, uh, Louis XVIII had sentenced Rigaud to death, and uh, Rigaud thought that might be a convenient time to come to the United States. So he came to Philadelphia in 1817. So Rigaud was given command of the group aboard the Huntress, and there were about 90 of them, and they set sail. Now, there were a couple of things about uh, the men and material aboard the Huntress that might have cast a little doubt on the agricultural nature of this colony. First, most of the men were former officers in Napoleon's Grand Army, not exactly a big group of farmers. Secondly, in the cargo hold of the Huntress were 600 muskets, 400 swords, and 12,000 pounds of gunpowder. There were even six field artillery pieces. So that was not exactly a load of farming supplies headed to Lalamond's new colony in Texas. Um, There was a man on board that ship who wrote a letter to a relative. This letter was published in Paris in 1822, and he wrote that he had actually, when he signed up for Lalamond's expedition, he had actually signed up for a military expedition against Florida, purportedly under a secret agreement that Lalamon had made with the U.S. So as Lalamon was recruiting these sailors, and there aren't a lot of other firsthand accounts, but at least this one sailor knew that it was a military expedition. He had no expectation of raising any crops, and he thought that, uh, or at least Lalamon must have told him, that the U.S. and Lalamon had a secret agreement to go liberate Florida from the Spanish. So at least those rumors, we know where they might have gotten started. But that got this sailor on board the ship, and who knows what he told the others. This sailor also said that he did not know that they were going to Texas. They didn't know the ultimate destination. Um, But once on board the ship, Rigaud organized the men into staff, officers, and staff. And uh, one of the funny tales was the, the ship was so cramped that uh, the sailor wrote that they had to sleep four to a bed, so everybody had to turn over at one time. Uh, So I can't imagine what that must have been like. But they finally finally made it. As they made it past New Orleans, they were finally told that the destination was going to be Galveston. And Galveston at that time was described as a desert island. Uh, It was also described as uninhabited, but it was noted that it was the headquarters for the famous pirate, Jean Lafitte or Jean Lafitte and uh, the ship as the Huntress came into what is now the ship channel and of course then was there was no such thing and the space between the Bavler Peninsula and Galveston Island uh, they were intercepted by a ship flying a Spanish flag which would have been bad news they were boarded and upon revealing who they were uh, the captain of the purportedly Spanish ship revealed himself as one of the Lafitte's pirates, and he guided him over the bar and into Galveston Harbor. The sailor described Galveston Harbor as having only three cabins for all of Lafitte's pirates. Now, I suspect he didn't see the whole thing, because we know that Lafitte built a house down there, and certainly there was more than just three cabins, but maybe not. That's all he saw. He described that there were no trees on the island anywhere, and the men disembarked, and pitched their camp on Galveston to wait for Lalamon. There were multiple complaints in this letter about no drinking water, terrible morale under Rigaud. There were duels every day. And, of course, the famous mosquitoes were mentioned, and it was basically total chaos. The, the sailor who was a, a soldier in the Army, or had been, described Lafitte's men as, quote, freebooters gathered from among all the nations of the earth determined to put into practice the traditions of the buccaneers of old, close quote. Well, that wasn't much of a compliment, but at least we know that our local Texas pirates were real pirates. Lalamon had sailed from Philadelphia on a ship called the Actress with another group of men, and they made it to Galveston in February 1818. It was February 19th, 1818. And the sailor who wrote the letter described a big party as being thrown when Lalamon came. And they left the island as soon as possible. Lalamon probably realized he needed to keep his troops busy and get them out of the way of the pirates. So they took off from Galveston 
on March 10th. Now, some accounts of this voyage talk about nine boats leaving. Some accounts, uh, one account in particular, said they had 24 boats. However many boats they had, they bought the boats and the provisions from the pirate Jean Lafitte. So they get into Galveston Bay, and almost immediately a storm comes up. Now, I'm guessing this time period might have been a very windy, cold front, but whatever it was, started swamping their boats. One boat sank with only one survivor. One boat leaked so bad that they had to throw everything out and were just bailing for their lives. And eventually the remaining boats made it to what was described as Redfish Bar. Um, and we, Redfish Island is now out in Galveston Bay, almost due east of San Leon. And so somewhere in that area, uh, they made camp. And they waited a few days, which also suggests to me that maybe it was kind of a stormy cold front. And on March 14th, they kept headed, kept heading for the mouth of the Trinity River. That was their goal. Well, they made it to Perry's Point. Now, Perry's Point was a spot on shore. It was a bluff on the east side of Trinity Bay, just below the present-day town of Anahuac. And at this point, when they made landfall at Perry's Point, Lalamon took 100 men and decided to go overland to the colony. And the rest of the men were going to bring the boats and the supplies up the Trinity River. So let's talk for a minute where exactly this colony was located. The location was on the Trinity River, just northwest of Liberty, Texas. And if you look on a map, there's a historical location, and I'll talk about it in the Getting There segment at the end of this episode. There's some information about the historical location, but honestly, we don't exactly know where this colony was. There are some Texas archaeologists who have conducted some searches uh, for the colony, and I'll try to update that information and put it on the website. But if you look at the only pair of coordinates that I could find, you find the location on the river just northwest, almost the outskirts of Liberty, Texas. And that would have been about a 35-mile walk from Anahuac, from present-day Anahuac and where they were. So off Lalamon goes. Here's the problem. He only took two days of provisions because I suppose they assumed that the boats would be right there with them, and they were not. So they had a little problem. They did arrive at the location, but they didn't have enough to eat. But it turns out that many of the men saw a plant growing on the ground that looked a lot like lettuce. So most of them thought that was a great deal and ate it. Big mistake. Uh, Everyone who ate it fell deathly ill. Uh, The reports, the firsthand accounts talk about the men going into convulsions, cramps, hallucinations. They were basically totally incapacitated. One of the accounts of that time describes it as epilepsy. So a few men had not eaten the plant, and they turned out to be okay. Well, lucky for everybody who had, a Cushada Indian wandered by. And who knows what he must have seen with a hundred men, most of whom were on the ground thrashing around and looked like they were about to die. He figured out, the, the Cushada Indian figured out what they had eaten, ran off into the woods, came back very quickly with a, a whole lot of plants in his hand. They boiled them. And everybody that had eaten the plant uh, eventually recovered. Nobody died. Although, one of the firsthand accounts of the events say that many of the men lost their memory for a solid month, and some never truly entirely recovered. And that same account also described some of the men as, quote, remain like imbeciles for four or five days, close quote. Well, in the interest of uh, closing up the details, I consulted with... Uh, Miss Rachel Stinson, a master gardener. And Rachel Stinson's roots go back to the 1820s in Liberty County, which is where this colony would have been located. And she deduced that what the men had probably eaten was pokeweed. So don't get out there and uh, try to eat a bunch of pokeweed. It didn't work out very well. Well, the men with the boats finally arrived six days later. Why six days later? Well, they had gotten lost, and anyone who's been to southeast Texas in this area in the mouth of the Trinity knows that would be very easy to do because there's lots of bayous, lots of creeks, and uh, they probably went up, several of them, 
and how they decided they were in the wrong place, we'll never know. But six days later, they arrive, and they had a similar problem. The men in the boats had provisions for eight days, and it had now been six. And so it would take a 15-day round trip to go get more provisions from Jean Lafitte. So some boats immediately turned around and headed off for the 15-day round trip to Galveston. But, of course, they got lost too. And so they didn't return for 27 days. It took two full months before this group had enough provisions to live on. Well, Alamon named his colony, and and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Champ d'Azil, or uh, translates to the Field of Asylum. And the men immediately began building forts. Now, there are varying accounts of exactly what they had built. Some were written by the men who were there, uh, but even those aren't exactly the same. Uh, Some were written by the Spanish who eventually took notes on what they had found when the colony was deserted. Uh, But basically, the things that are agreed upon is there were two earthen forts on the north side. Uh, One guarded the bank of the Trinity and one guarded the northeast corner of the camp. There were some cabins that were built around a parade ground, and there were some other buildings built, like a hospital and various other things, and they stretched some of those buildings down the river. So obviously you'd want to be have as many of your uh, operational buildings uh, on the river as you could. Once they got up and established, they started military drills and started getting organized. Lalamon issues a written proclamation. Now, this proclamation is really more of a manifesto. And in it, Lalamon stated the existence of the colony and the purpose of the colony. He said the colonists had no hostile intentions and that they wanted to be good neighbors. Uh, He also made a point to say that only French people or former French army members, which were not all French, uh, would be admitted to the colony. And he published this document as best he could. The document took off. It ended up being published far and wide in both the U.S. and Europe. The people in France were especially excited about this because there was still a lot of sentiment for Napoleon around. There was a collection of 100,000 francs ended up eventually being collected in Paris to support this new colony in Texas. Uh, Now, it took about a year to get those 100,000 francs, and the colony was long gone, as we'll learn in a minute. But they... uh, There was a lot of excitement, and this colony was written about all over France as this sanctuary for um, Bonapartist refugees. And one of the members uh, of the colony, in an attempt to sort of sell it, uh, said that everything was peaceful and everything was great. Uh, That is, until they tried to grow food. Now, remember, the agricultural purpose for which this colony was purportedly founded. Well, they weren't very good at agriculture at all, and their first attempts to raise any kind of crops were not successful. They did do some fishing in the Trinity. There was some writing by some of the men about the alligators in the Trinity River, and they also wrote specifically about 15 or 16-foot gars, um, and that how big they were. They were two or three feet across, and you can imagine Uh, They also mentioned that it was not safe to go swimming in the Trinity, so they didn't do a lot of that. Uh, But they were fairly successful hunters. Um, Not all the colonists were men, by the way. Uh, Rigo's daughter was part of the General Rigo's daughter was there in the colony. There were several women and children that had joined Lalamon's expedition. There was a couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Viol. Uh, They had gotten married in Alabama. Some of the colonists from Philadelphia had made it to Alabama. Uh, They had gotten married and they set out for Champ d'Azil immediately after getting married. So they were basically spending their honeymoon exploring the wilderness of Texas. And uh, the, some of the writers described uh, a very lovely existence. All the families were happy. Everybody doted on the children and life was good. There was, however, another side to the story. Uh, Other writers of the time described the camp life as horribly disorganized and lots of conflict, horrible morale, etc. Now, you can imagine trying to settle uh, in the swamps of the Trinity River. Uh, It would just be extraordinarily difficult. What made it even worse was the fact that most of the men in this expedition had not only all been in Napoleon's Grand Army, but they had all been officers. 
So I can only imagine uh, getting a group of guys who are used to being supervisors together and telling some of them that they're no longer going to be supervisors. That is a very difficult job. Well, about a month after they arrived, uh, four of the men found it too difficult. They got an Indian guide, and they deserted the colony. They made it to Louisiana. Now, Lalamon was chasing them. He sent some men after them. So that tells you a little bit about where Lalamon's head was. Uh, but they did end up making it to Louisiana. They were uh, actually not French. They had been French Army officers, but they were not French. Uh, they were Spaniards. And when they got to Louisiana, had claimed that Lalimon tricked them into going to this colony. So I suppose they thought they were retiring to become farmers. I don't know. I doubt it. But that's what they said. Well, after a few months, the colony, three or four months, the colony got word that the Spanish were not entirely pleased with their presence in New Spain, as you might imagine. And the Spanish sent a force from Bejar, and probably, my guess is, from some troops from La Bahia, to march on Champ d'Azile. The Spanish commander, though, stopped that little Spanish force at the San Marcos River. Now, in those days, the San Marcos River would have been close enough to have made the colony feel threatened, but it was far enough that the French were not going to be able to figure out exactly how large this force was. Nevertheless, uh, Lalamon thought discretion the better part of valor and ordered Champ d'Azil abandoned after only five months. The colonists packed up and retreated to Galveston. By late July, uh, they were on their way back to Galveston. So they had arrived in March. It was now July, and they arrive in Galveston. In Galveston was an agent of the United States, a man named George Graham. He had traveled to Galveston to see if this French colony of Champ d'Azil would accept American jurisdiction, which is an interesting thought. Remember that neutral ground agreement we were talking about. Unfortunately, Graham fell ill. He had to return to New Orleans almost immediately. Uh, the colonists were starving to death. I mean, they had, you know, not raised any meaningful food. Uh, they, they were dependent on Lafitte for their provisions, and they were getting restless, I would imagine. Lalamon went with Graham to New Orleans and told his people that he would come back with provisions and some plans. He never did return to Texas. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the colonists, the suffering was so bad in Galveston, one of the colonists just signed up with Lafitte to become a pirate. And uh, actually several colonists ended up signing up with Lafitte. That was better than sitting around waiting on Lalamond. Uh, to make matters worse, there was a hurricane. In the middle of September uh, 1818, there was a a hurricane that hit Galveston. It totally flooded the island. Recall from earlier episodes of Wise About Texas that the island before the seawall at its highest point was only eight feet above sea level. The island was flooded. Lots of Lafitte's infrastructure was destroyed in that storm, and that certainly didn't help the morale of the colonists. About a month later, here comes some, another agent, this time an agent of Spain, and he told those French colonists in no uncertain terms to get the heck out of Spain. Now, he must have said it pretty strongly because it's reported in one firsthand account that six men deserted right then and there and actually left with the Spanish troops. So everybody was ready to get out of there. Eventually, uh, the colonists made it to New Orleans. By the end of 1818, uh, the new Napoleonic Republic in Texas was no more and was, in fact, a total failure. Well, one loose end remained from all this. What about that money that was raised in Paris? Well, that money actually made it to Louisiana. A committee in Louisiana, a committee was formed to distribute those funds among the colonists. And this was a little painful because Lalamon really was not in a hurry to cooperate. He had decided to become an American citizen. Um, and as an American citizen, he earned a living basically by defrauding his friends. He would get his friends to guarantee notes. Uh, he'd borrow the money and just never pay the notes. Lalamon had uh, bought a farm in New Orleans. He bought another farm in Metairie, Louisiana, mortgaged it all, and uh, just wasn't borrowed other money and wasn't going to pay it back. Um, eventually, he returned to Europe. 
Uh, now, remember, Lalamon was so close to Napoleon. When Napoleon died, he left Lalamon 100,000 francs in his will. So Lalamon had a new start. And he ended up serving on the French Council of Peers and also eventually became the military commander of Corsica, uh, ironically enough, where Napoleon was born. So he sort of restarted his life in France. He died in Paris in 1839. Uh, General Rigo was a little more industrious. He ended up moving with his son and his son's family to St. Martinsville, Louisiana. Unfortunately, as did so many during this time in the South, he caught yellow fever and died in New Orleans in 1820. Oh, those honeymooners I mentioned, let me tell you what happened to them. The honeymooners for, from uh, Champ de Seal uh, settled in St. Martinsville also, and uh, Dr. Voile practiced medicine successfully until his death in 1845. So the grand plans of Napoleon's general lasted a mere five months. There's no doubt that he wanted to at least establish a launch point uh, for further Napoleonic military efforts somewhere, Uh, but maybe he really wanted to just start building an empire. Um, I suspect there was some thinking about Mexico, um, but nevertheless, it was fairly poorly thought out and definitely poorly executed. It was, however, probably the last armed incursion into Texas and the end of the filibustering era until the Texas Revolution. Uh, The other thing that's always intrigued me about this is Gene Lafitte's role. What was his interest in all this? Remember, he went back and forth as an agent for Spain and an agent for the United States. And uh, he had helped the United States in the War of 1812, uh, but he had also helped the Spanish and had reported on United States activities. And he was eager to help these French colonists. So give some thought to that and give me a little feedback on what you think the pirate Jean Lafitte had to gain from this little colony. I will tell you that Champ d'Azil had an interesting effect on international affairs, I think, because the very next year was the Adams-O'Neese Treaty that I talked about in the Greer County episode, episode 29 of Wise About Texas. We talked about the Adams-O'Neese Treaty, which set the borders between uh, Louisiana and New Spain. And so there's no question that that treaty was hastened by this little excursion or incursion, as the case may be. And also interesting is the U.S. agent talking about U.S. jurisdiction over Champ de Seal because uh, remember that Lalamond told at least some of his recruits that he had a secret deal with the U.S. government. And so why would the U.S. government be interested in jurisdiction over Champ de Seal. Well, that would sort of uh, invalidate the neutral ground agreement and more aggressively establish an American presence in a portion of New Spain uh, that was at the very least disputed, but also very hard for the Spanish to reach. Uh, So that's an interesting little tidbit related to this story. Well, nothing remains of Champ de Seal. The Spanish who had been on the San Marcos River, uh, went ahead and came into Champ de Seal, found it abandoned. They did do a drawing, which I will put on the website, and then they burned it to the ground. And uh, after they burned it, that was the end of Napoleon's new empire in Texas. Well, now we come to the part of the show I call Getting There. This is where I tell you how to find a couple of the places we talked about in the episode. I just got through telling you we don't know exactly where Champ de Seal is, but the Spanish had burned it anyway. I'm going to give you the coordinates that I found that were listed as the historical location. And this is basically, when I say listed as historical location, this is where somebody sometime thought it was. So I'm going to give you these coordinates. It's uh, 30.07 degrees latitude and 94.81 degrees longitude. And that puts it on the banks of the Trinity just outside the town of Liberty, Texas. There's no marker to Champ to Champ de Seal. There's no historical marker. Uh, I have not personally driven to the site. Sometimes I go check these places out before the episode. I've yet to do that. I will do that in the next month or so. Uh, it looks, if you Google Earth it, it looks like there might be a pipeline near this location, but I doubt it's accessible. G- the pirate Jean Lafitte's headquarters was located at 1417 
Harborside Drive in Galveston, Texas. That's 1417 Harborside Drive. You can drive right up to his old front door. There's a historical marker at that address for Jean Lafitte. Uh, there is a structure on the site. It does look like the remnants of what perhaps might be a pirate headquarters, but that actually the structure was built by some new owners and is not uh, are not the remains of Lafitte's actual headquarters. Lafitte built a house a little bit away from his village, and he called it La Maison Rouge, or the Red House. And uh, it's interesting that he built it away from his village. The village that he had on Galveston, he called Campeche. And so I think when the sailor from the Champ de Zeal uh, colony, when he arrived in Galveston and said, well, there were only three cabins for Lafitte's pirates, he was probably at Campeche and didn't know that Lafitte has, had built an actual um, house up on what is now Harborside Drive. Back then, by the way, would have been right on the water. The drawings of the time, there are a couple of drawings that should purport to show uh, Lafitte's headquarters. And you, sh- you see ships that are docked right up next to the house. So that would have been right up there. His house would have been right up on the harbor. Um, that structure that you see if you go to Harborside Drive now uh, was built on the foundation of the old house, uh, of Lafitte's house, although there is one story that a, a sea captain had built another house on the site, and that's the actual foundation. I don't know. More interesting, though, is uh, there's a legend that there are some ghost dogs running around. They're known as the Campeche Devil Dogs, and it's said that Lafitte had a voodoo queen cast a spell over some black puppies that belonged to him and that the ghosts of those dogs are present on that site. So be very careful. Um, the French colony, uh, Champ de Seal, was saved by one Cachada Indian after they ate all that pokeweed. Now, the Cachada tribe was one of the very few tribes that Mirabeau Lamar did not try to run out of Texas. Um, they received a reservation in 1854 along with the Alabama tribe, and uh, the Alabama Cachada reservation is still there, and they have a campground that's open to the public and also a gaming hall. So you can go up there and check that out. It's in Livingston, Texas. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Be sure and follow the show on Facebook, Wise About Texas. Go to Twitter and Instagram, at Wise About Texas, and you can follow the show. Also, if you'd like to support the show financially, there's a Patreon page at www.patreon.com, patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. I want to wish everyone out there a very happy, healthy, and prosperous 2017. Thank you for your interest in Texas history. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.